Hi. It's story time again. Are you ready for another tale? Wonderful. Well, if you settle down, close your eyes and listen. I will read for you The Boy Who Found Fear at Last. Once upon a time, there lived a woman who had one son whom she loved dearly. The little cottage in which they dwelt was built on the outskirts of a forest, and as they had no neighbours, the place was very lonely, and the boy was kept at home by his mother to bear her company. They were sitting together on a winter's evening when a storm suddenly sprang up, and the wind blew the door open. The woman started and shivered and glanced over her shoulder as if she half expected to see some horrible thing behind her. Go and shut the door, she said hastily to her son. I feel frightened. Frightened? repeated the boy. What does it feel like to be frightened? Well, just frightened, answered the mother. A fear of something, you hardly know what, takes hold of you. It must be very odd to feel like that, replied the boy. I will go through the world and seek fear till I find it. And the next morning, before his mother was out of bed, he had left the forest behind him. After walking for some hours, he reached a mountain which he began to climb. Near the top, in a wild and rocky space, he came upon a band of fierce robbers sitting around a fire. The boy, who was cold and tired, was delighted to see the bright flames. So he went up to them and said, Good greeting to you, sirs and wriggled himself in between the men, till his feet almost touched the burning logs. The robbers stopped drinking and eyed him curiously, and at last the captain spoke. No caravan of armed men would dare come here. Even the very birds shun our camp. And who are you to venture in so boldly? Oh, I have left my mother's house in search of fear. Perhaps you can show it to me. Fear is wherever we are, answered the captain. But where? asked the boy, looking round. I see nothing. Take this pot, and some flour, and butter, and sugar over to the churchyard, which lies down there, and bake us a cake for supper, replied the robber. And the boy, who was by this time quite warm, jumped up cheerfully, and slinging the pot over his arm, ran down the hill. When he got to the churchyard, he collected some sticks and made a fire. Then he filled the pot with water from a little stream close by, and mixing the flour and butter and sugar together, he set the cake on to cook. It was not long before it grew crisp and brown, and then the boy lifted it from the pot and placed it on a stone while he put out the fire. At that moment a hand was stretched from the grave, and a voice said, Is that cake for me? Do you think I am going to give to the dead the food of the living? replied the boy with a laugh, and giving the hand a tap with his spoon and picking up the cake, he went up the mountainside, whistling merrily. Well, have you found fear? asked the robbers as he held out the cake to the captain. No. Was it there? answered the boy. I saw nothing but a hand which came from a grave, and belonged to somebody who wanted my cake, but I just wrapped the fingers with my spoon and said it was not for him, and then the hand vanished. Oh, how nice the fire is! And he flung himself on his knees before it, and so did not notice the glances of surprise cast by the robbers at each other. 
There is another chance for you, said one at length. On the other side of the mountain lies a deep pool. Go to that, and perhaps you may meet fear on the way. I hope so, indeed, answered the boy, and he set out at once. He soon beheld the waters of the pool gleaming in the moonlight, and as he drew near he saw a tall swing standing over it, and in the swing a child was seated, weeping bitterly. That is a strange place for a swing, thought the boy, but I wonder what he is crying about. And he hurried on towards the child, when a maiden ran up and spoke to him. I want to lift my little brother from the swing, cried she, but it is so high above me that I cannot reach, if you will get closer to the edge of the pool, and let me mount on your shoulder, I think I can reach him. Willingly, replied the boy, and in an instant the girl had climbed to his shoulders, but instead of lifting the child from the swing, as she could easily have done, she pressed her feet so firmly on either side of the youth's neck, that he felt that in another minute he would be choked, or else fall into the water beneath him. So gathering up his strength, he gave a mighty heave, and threw the girl backwards. As she touched the ground, a bracelet fell from her arm, and this youth picked it up, I may as well keep it as a remembrance of all the queer things that have happened to me since I left home, he said to himself, and turning to look for the child, he saw that both it and the swing had vanished, and that the first streaks of dawn were in the sky. With the bracelet on his arm, the youth started for a little town, which was situated in the plain on the further side of the mountain and as hungry and thirsty, he entered its principal streets. A man stopped him. Where did you get that bracelet? asked the man. It belongs to me. No, it's mine, replied the boy. It is not. Give it to me at once, or it will be the worse for you, cried the man. Let us go before the judge and tell him our stories, said the boy. If he decides in your favour, you shall have it. If in mine, I will keep it. To this the man agreed, and the two went together to the great hall, in which the caddy was administering justice. He listened very carefully to what each had to say, and pronounced his verdict. Neither of the two claimants had proved his right to the bracelet, therefore it must remain in the possession of the judge, till its fellow was brought before him. When they heard this, the man and boy looked at each other, and their eyes said, Where are we going to find the other one? But as they knew there was no use in disputing the decision, they bowed low and left the hall of audience. Wandering he knew not whither, the youth found himself on the seashore. A little distance was a ship which had struck on a hidden rock and was rapidly sinking, while on deck the crew were gathered with faces white as death, shrieking and wringing their hands. Have you met with fear? shouted the boy, and the answer came above the noise of the waves. Oh, help! Help! We are drowning! And the boy flung off his clothes and swam to the ship where many hands were held out to draw him on board. The ship is tossed hither and thither, and will soon be sucked down, cried the crew again. Death is very near. We are frightened. Give me a rope, said the boy in reply, and he took it, and made it safe around his body at one end, and to the mast at the other, and sprang into the sea. Down he went, down, down, till at last his feet touched the bottom, and he stood up and looked about him. Sure enough, a sea maiden with a wicked face was tugging hard at a chain 
which she had fastened to the ship with a grappling iron, and was dragging it bit by bit beneath the waves. Seizing her arms in both his hands, he forced her to drop the chain, and the ship above remaining steady, the sailors were able gently to float her off the rocks. Then taking a rusty knife from a heap of seaweed at his feet, he cut the rope around his waist, and fastened the sea maiden firmly to a stone, so that she could do no more mischief, and bidding her farewell, he swam back to the beach, where his clothes were still lying. The youth dressed himself quickly and walked on, till he came to a beautiful shady garden, filled with flowers and a clear little stream running through. The day was hot and he was tired, so he entered the gate and seated himself under a clump of bushes, covered with sweet-smelling red blossoms and it was not long before he fell asleep. Suddenly a rush of wings and a cool breeze awakened him, and raising his head cautiously, he saw three doves plunging into the stream. They splashed joyfully about and shook themselves, and dived to the bottom of a deep pool. When they appeared again, there were no longer three doves, but three beautiful damsels, bearing between them a table made of mother of pearl. On this they placed drinking cups, fashioned from pink and green shells, and one of the maidens filled a cup from a crystal goblet, and was raising it to her mouth when her sister stopped her. To whose health do you drink? asked she. To the youth who prepared the cake and wrapped my hand with the spoon when I stretched it out of the earth, answered the maiden, and was never afraid, as other men were. But to whose health do you drink? To the youth on whose shoulders I climbed at the edge of the pool, and who threw me off with such a jerk that I lay unconscious on the ground for hours, replied the second. But you, my sister, added she, turning to the third girl, to whom do you drink? Down in the sea I took hold of a ship and shook it and pulled at it, till it would soon have been lost, said she. And as she spoke she looked quite different from what she had done with the chain in her hands, seeking to work mischief. But a youth came and freed the ship and bound me to a rock. To his help I drink. And they all three lifted their cup and drank silently. As they put their cups down, the youth appeared before them. Here I am, the youth whose health you have drunk, and now give me the bracelet that matches a jewelled band, which of a surety fell from the arm of one of you. A man tried to take it from me, and I would not let him have it, and he dragged me before the caddy who kept my bracelet till I could show him its fellow, and I have been wandering hither and thither in search of it, and that is how I have found myself in such strange places. Come with us, then, said the maidens, and they led him down a passage into a hall, out of which opened many chambers, each one of greater splendour than the last. From a shelf heaped up, with gold and jewels, the eldest sister took a bracelet, which, in every way, was exactly like the one which was in the judge's keeping, and fastened it to the youth's arm. Go at once and show this to the caddy, she said, and he will give you the fellow to it. I shall never forget you, answered the youth, but it may be long before we meet again for I shall never rest till I have found fear. Then he went on his way, and won the bracelet from the caddy. After this, he again set forth in his quest of fear. On and on walked the youth, but fear never crossed his path. And one day he entered a large town, 
that all the streets and squares were so full of people he could hardly pass between them. Why are all these crowds gathered together? he asked of a man who was stood next to him. The ruler of this country is dead, was the reply, and he had no children. It is needful to choose a successor. Therefore, each morning, one of the sacred pigeons is let loose from the tower yonder, and on whomsoever the bird shall perch, that man is our king. In a few minutes the pigeon will fly. Wait and see what happens. Every eye was fixed on the tall tower which stood in the centre of the chief square, and the moment that the sun was seen to stand straight over it, a door was opened, and a beautiful pigeon, gleaming with pink and grey, blue and green, came rushing through the air. Onward it flew, onward, onward, till at length it rested on the head of the boy. Then a great shout arose, A king, a king! But as he listened to the cries, a vision swifter than lightning flashed across his brain. He saw himself seated on a throne, spending his life trying, and never succeeding, to make poor people rich, miserable people happy, bad people good, never doing anything he wished to do, not able even to marry the girl he loved. No, no, he shrieked, hiding his face in his hands. But the crowd who heard him thought he was overcome by the grandeur that awaited him, and paid no heed. Well, to make sure, let fly more pigeons fly, said they. But each pigeon followed where the first had led, and the cries arose louder than ever. A king! A king! And as the young man heard a cold shiver that he knew not the meaning of ran through him. This is fear whom you have long sought, whispered a voice, which seemed to reach his ears alone. And the youth bowed his head as the vision once more flashed before his eyes, and he accepted his doom, and made ready to pass his life with fear beside him. Peaceful slumbers. Sleep sweet.